Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with my illustrious co-host, Matt Scott. I am sitting in the general vicinity. Who does have some news he's going to share with us in a couple minutes, so we're we'll excited to hear about Big news. Actually, news that. on two fronts that yes. are very significant. To okay, me. all right, so you'll have yeah. to stand by for that. But the most important person in the room is Nina Barlow. Nina is has been in this industry for nearly 30 years and has literally changed the landscape of much of what we do, particularly around events and four-wheel drive training and vehicle rentals. So her business is expansive and services our industry in many different ways. And of course, with all of that time, you've gained so much experience and knowledge. So we're going to ask her a bunch of questions today, not only about how did she get to this point, but the lessons that Nina has learned along the way. So Nina, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. My honor. We're going to take a brief break and we will be right back. This week's episode is supported in part by iCamper. They make innovative hard shell and soft sided roof tents that are designed to survive long term overland use. Their revolutionary X cover won the Overland Journal Editor's Choice Award, eliminating the bulky PVC cover and also allowing for the fitment of crossbars for carrying bikes and kayaks. Their Sky Camp Mini is another award winning design that provides a hard shell tent in the footprint of a much smaller clamshell. Model. This is the perfect solution for smaller vehicles or on vehicles where rack space is dedicated to other systems. iCamper believes that the best times are those spent traveling, discovering the world with those you love most. You can find out more about their quality tents at iCamper.com. Oh yeah, totally. Well, and and I I mean I think back on all of the times that we've done cool little projects together, including, I think we got wrangled into a Jalopnik winching video at one point in time. (laughs) Totally (laughs) off the cuff. (laughs) It was totally like, Hey guys, can we get, can we get you guys stuck and shoot a video? Sure. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We we figured it out. That was really, that was really fun. So yeah, we've definitely seen each other at a lot of events and, and I've heard your stories of success. So one of the things that I wanted to ask was how did you get from wherever you were living in the country. So maybe share a little bit about where you grew up and what were some of the experiences that you had that led you to wanting to to become a four-wheel drive trainer and expert? So I grew up in the desert outside of Palm Springs, California. Okay. I graduated of Palm Springs High School. I won't I say when. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a few years ago. Right. Um, it was a thousand acre ranch. And um, so four-wheeling was just part of daily life, really. And I think it was maybe sometime in my 20s that I realized that people did this just for fun also. (laughs) Um, I remember um, my dad had an early Bronco, and um, if he showed up, you know, to pick me up at school, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, that was just, oh, my gosh, that was so embarrassing. Sure. (laughs) And what you would give to have that car now. Right. Yeah, there was, when he sold it, there was rending of garments and gnashing of teeth in the family, (laughs) definitely. You know, outdoor industry became part of my life when um, I started getting involved with um, the hot air balloon business okay. in Palm Springs and uh, because I could drive a truck and trailer and I could four-wheel so sure. ground crew stuff there. And then um, uh, I went away to college, um, was still doing that. Um, and what did you go to college for? I went to college for sports and recreation management. Uh, well, and that's what a, you do. With a coaching <laughs> certification. Oh, right? that's yeah, so cool. Absolutely. I got college credit for rafting. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I did not. Yeah, I was clearly on the wrong degree program. <laughs> right. I, went, I went to school in Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> yeah. Why? No, whitewater rafting in yeah. Peoria. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I came back, I knew I didn't want to go back to Southern California at that point. Um, I had had family in, uh, and my, my family had owned property in Sedona since the 70s. And mm. so I kind of knew that's where I'd end up. And uh, just went to work in the, as a Jeep tour guide in the Jeep tour business, which has, of course, been you know booming since the 60s there. I didn't know and, it was that long yeah, ago. Yeah, Pink Jeep started. Um, Don Pratt was actually a realtor and uh, would take people around in a Jeep to get them excited cool about the area about real sure. estate. And he realized that the taking them around there. was more of the attraction than <laughs> actually selling the real estate. <laughs> of course, both now. Sure. <laughs> um, and I ended up, uh, you know, that was just kind of uh, getting in the Jeep tour business and Jeep business was kind of um, something to do until I settled down, 
you know, got a real job, sure. became an adult. <laughs> you know. So overrated. So, yeah. <laughs> so here we are, you know, 30 years later, that just, the, that whole settling down and getting a real yeah. job thing. Has Growing it, up has is, it, in fact, overrated. Yeah. Right. yeah. And optional. Yeah, it, it is. You get to make choices. <laughs> yeah, totally. I've never had a real job, ever. It's <laughs> yeah. true. I mean. Right. Yeah. Not that I'll admit to. Right. <laughs> So um, and I wouldn't change that. I started my own business in 2004 after working for other companies um, for about 10 years. And um, I had a lot of great bosses. And then I had a lot of the bosses that we would say, you know, you learned a lot what not to do. Oh, sure. So, yeah, sure. So those are some of the earliest lessons. And that's, and that's no question part of what forms us as entrepreneurs is those experiences where you see this is an opportunity or they're not doing it in this way. And mm-hmm. I think that that's a really interesting way to go about it. Now, when you were on the ranch, so this this is kind of a fun thing about you that I didn't know about the cattle ranch because my family had a cattle ranch in Arizona and just outside of Casa Grande. And so I learned a lot about driving off-road on the ranch because it was just part of your job. Exactly. So you didn't want to get stuck. Right. And, and there were some really practical, I mean, the, the vehicles were always, always aired down, not that low, but they were always aired mm-hmm. down. It, in some capacity and you kind of learned momentum a little bit but you didn't want to beat the trucks up because then you had to you know you were in trouble if you if you broke something yeah. so <laughs> right? you strike that that really fine balance what were some of the things that you learned about vehicles or also I s- suspect you were riding horses at the time what were some of the things that were takeaways from you from the family ranch don't get caught <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, there, there's some. Yeah, there's some things that we did that certainly is. I, I had cousins and and um, and it was definitely. Oh, don't tell our dads. We well, we got to figure out how to get ourselves out of this. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> That's good advice. So <clears throat> all that are listening, don't get caught. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what did you guys use out on the ranch for vehicles? Were they mostly full size trucks and things like that? Yes, mostly mostly full size. Uh, you know, heavy duty trucks. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, the tractors and, and we had the, the Bronco, the 56 Bronco too. And then you were probably towing stock trailers around in the sand and through washes and everything else. I mean, it's amazing how much you learn about driving. And for me, it was definitely on the ranch. And then when I was working out at the Barium Goldwater and doing patrol, it's like, I was always in four wheel drive. Right. And I just, it became like I was doing it eight hours a day, every single day. And it's amazing what you learn about just the subtleties of driving right. from that. And do you find that was the case for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sand, we had a lot of sand um, and we had a lot of washes. And um, so one of, one of our, don't, don't, don't let our dads catch us uh, stories was I had the, you know, the long bed crew cab and I knew just enough at that point. I think I was 12. Okay. Um, All right. And I knew just enough that this wash was too narrow to get this truck across if I just went straight through, you know. So I knew just enough that I was like, well, I'll use momentum. You know? <laughs> and it was enough to get the front bumper hung up on the far side of the wash and the, and the tailgate hung up on the back side with all four <laughs> tires hanging in the air. <laughs> it was like, boy, I could have used some Max tracks then. <laughs> Oh, those, those are great hour, stories. Hours of rock stacking and yeah. <laughs> jacking. <laughs> well, and y- most of your days, even mm-hmm. though you're managing, uh, how big is your team now? Because you have two locations, mm-hmm. actually maybe three. Do you still do the Rubicon Trail work? We do, yeah. As far as brick and mortar locations um, for rental pickup and drop off stores, it's uh, the retail stores we yeah. call them. We just have Moab and Sedona. Yeah. Um, and then we hold permits in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, you know, Rubicon Trail, of course, we're up there just in the summertime. That's about a 10 or 12 week season, depending mm-hmm. on snowpack on one end and wildfires on the other sure um uh, down in uh, el centro yuma glamis area oh sure which of course this time of the year we get to follow the good weather around <laughs> for the most part um and uh so we operate uh, regularly in on the rubicon trail moab sedona el centro i feel like i'm forgetting something mm. <laughs> <I don't know. clears throat> so you drive these vehicles nearly every day you're oftentimes even though you run a large organization, you're still the subject matter expert for your team. You have un- other folks that can do work, but you're definitely the subject matter expert. So that keeps you out in the field a lot with OEMs and right. other other clients. 
you've had a lot of Jeeps. One of the questions that I was asking, in fact, you drove up in a four by E. How is the four by E to drive off road? Like for now that you've like really driven them. Right. Um, it's currently my favorite. For I many love reasons. the idea of the yeah. plug in hybrids. It's what 21 miles of electric range they claim. Yeah, it's and we've gotten up to 27. You know, okay, there's a, of good. course there's a lot of variability. Yeah. You know, just like gas mileage, you know, if you're driving sure. super fast or uphill, you know. But um, you know, it's my for the for the rally last year and and this year too coming up, um, you know, with Jeep, um, I had the choice of the the 392 or the 4 by e and it was hands down um, I want the 4 by e mm. Um for the amount of torque you have um, and the horsepower, but you get twice the range out of a tank of fuel. <laughs> Significant. Right. And, and so, so off, off road, what mm-hmm. are you noticing? Are you noticing things that don't work that well? Or are you noticing things that work even better with the electric? It is really a different experience when you drive it in all electric mode off road. And all you hear is the crunching of the tires. Um, needless to say on the 392, that's not the, the noise <laughs> you're hearing. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Have you bought a 392 yet? I have not. It is actually the only Wrangler drivetrain that I'm like, I don't need one of those, but yeah. I've got You don't want else. your clients I'm... in one of those. Yeah. For oh sure. yeah. That was of course when those were coming out. Oh, are you going to rent those? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> for those on YouTube, uh, you can fill in the blanks. <laughs> uh, uh. So it's, um, uh, they're fun to drive. You can't help but get in a 392 and turn 12. Yeah. We both mm. have driven them. I mean, you know. It's like, I haven't actually we, driven it. We've got one coming next week. Ooh. When were you going to tell me this? I, that's, we weren't. I, I, we yeah. weren't going to tell you. No. <laughs> it's coming. No. It's coming, Matt. Like, of, of all the press cars we get, the only two that have excited me are the Ford Maverick for some reason. Yeah, which is super cool. Like, there's, like there's been some really cool stuff that comes right. through the office. Ford Maverick, charming. 392, I want it. Want it. Like... Like, like, there's actually maybe a strategy that involves you working with Laura to ensure that I don't ever go too near it. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm staying out of that program. Versus a unit of yeah. measurement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now you've you've had everything from power wagons mm-hmm. to four by e's and mm-hmm. even Trailhawk Cherokees mm-hmm. and all. What is your favorite vehicle? Right now, it's, yeah. I, I don't know if Matt, Matt's going to look at me funny, but it's like, I, I didn't think I was going to like the Gladiator, but honestly. Um, Gladiator's as, great. Yeah. As far as the, the, the body and the setup, that, mm. that kind of midsize pickup truck setup, I didn't think I was going to like it because I have the Power Wagon, you know, and I have the Wrangler. Yeah. Um, and it's like, this is kind of in the middle. It's not the best at either thing. Sure. Uh, but honestly, it's um, now it's my, I'm using it 90% of the time. The power wagon sort of has been relegated to almost exclusively tow duty now. Sure. And, and Towing, going to yeah. Home Depot. Because I'm using <laughs> the, the Gladiator on the trail now. It's great. I just love, you know, we just got back from the dunes and it's like, you just fling your dirty Sandy Max tracks in the back, you know. Yeah. Like. <laughs> I, I, I think for, for overland use, the, the Gladiator is just really fast. It's it, really it takes, good. It takes almost all of the benefit of the Wrangler and then makes it more comfortable. Right. Yep. You know, it's that huge wheelbase. Mm-hmm. And then once you start to do anything to them, you mm-hmm. know, you, you put them on a two inch lift with 37s right. and the proportionality of it really comes into play. Um, I, I, I love mine. Right. Like, I don't know how much longer mine will be around, but it is probably well, we the, with you. It's, yeah, <laughs> it is probably the vehicle that I build like virtually mm-hmm. more than any other is yeah. there's something about that max toe package if you can, you know, I, the combination is tough because, like, I want the manual transmission, mm. which you can't get the max. So it, there's some things around it. But if I could end up with a manual transmission gladiator, mm. I, I, I just want I want it. So <laughs> I, want I want a white <laughs> white one. You know, I don't want I don't even want the Rubicon. I just want mm. like a basic gladiator. I think with a manual tra- with a manual transmission, uh, which will maximize the payload. And and I just I really kind of want it, but. So that's the one I build more often. I'm like, oh, it's just it just went up five grand in the last three months. <laughs> Somehow I, I keep I keep building JLs. All right, so let's let's pull it back into coming back around kind of your development in the industry. What was the first? What was that pivotal moment? Because I, I can think of mine. And and what was your what was your pivotal moment when you realized I'm going to be able to make a career out of this? Where you had that mm-hmm. moment of success. 
where you're now vaulted into this position of authority? So um, I had been training commercial guides when I was working for other companies, you know, training these tour guides. And, and I was getting a lot of requests. I'd get a guide that would say, hey, you know, my brother-in-law just bought a Jeep. He's not a guide, but would you mind spending you know, an hour or two with him, you know, showing him some stuff? And, and those started to get more frequent and it kind of dawned on me. I'm like, yeah, there, there could be a demand for this. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of take this program, this commercial mm. guide training program and kind of, um, you know, modify it for civilian use, so to speak, uh, sure. just recreational users. And, uh, and, you know, and then, you know, maybe one, one Saturday a month or something, you know, uh, I'll get business or printed, put a website up, just do a little side, side business. And within one year of doing that, I had so many requests. I left working for other people and, um, and, was on on my own running my own business and that was um it was kind of one of it was kind of that like frying head mm -hmm. frying pan in the back of the head moments where it was like yeah yeah i'm really <laughs> oh, good people, at this people yeah. want this you yeah, know for sure. and <laughs> you're really good at amazing it. Yeah. and it was yeah it was very very fun very uh very fulfilling you know yeah. to just see the light the light go on for people you know on stuff that i grew up with and just kind of took for granted yeah really so well we have always gotten great feedback on you as a trainer. In fact, Overland you. Journal uses you as our trainer. So you help train all of our new editors. You've spent a lot of time with Paula, our producer of the podcast recently, and <laughs> showing her how to drive in the dunes and everything else. So there's a reason why we use you as our trainer of choice is because you're, you're so excellent at building upon those founda foundational components of driving, which leads me to another question of what do you think are some of the two, three, four key co components of good driving? What makes for a good driver? Some things you can give so some basic advice what on. What I always tell my students first off, um, whether it's a rock crawling class or, or sand dunes class, it's like that, you know, um, when you're driving well, your, your career as a YouTube star is over. You know, it's a <laughs> good driving looks like ballet. So if I tell you, you all look like a bunch of ballerinas out here, that's a good thing. That's mm. a compliment. Um, so, you know, good driving is fluid, whether you're going a half a mile an hour in a, in a boulder field or 120 miles an hour, you know, around a racetrack, you know, whatever you're driving, your corrections are smooth. Mm. It's your throttle, your brake, your steering inputs are all very fluid and smooth. And that comes from looking further ahead. Um, we spend a lot of time just teaching people how to look. It's amazing how uh, people fixate on like what's right in front of their hood. And, um, you know, if you've done track driving um, and you're taught that you don't look at the tire wall in the corner, you're looking where you're coming out the on exit, the other side. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I've had trainers on tracks that they will actually block the windshield of the car. So you can only look at, you're doing your laps and you're only looking out the side. Sure. <laughs> I don't think they do that anymore. There's like OSHA and Some, insurance companies and things about <laughs> it. <laughs> but that's a modern society. <laughs> but that's a great Before example. Before Matt's time. No. <laughs> that's a great example. I'm going to have to think of a zinger for you now. Okay. You guys have gotten two zingers. Yeah, he's going to he's gonna make old people jokes or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, boomer. <laughs> <laughs> We're not boomers. No. We're not boomers. Gen X, baby. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, so that that's that's some great insights. What mm -hmm. are some other things that come to mind that you think are are these core principles of mm -hmm. people driving well? So it's it it's the looking further ahead that's going to help you make your smooth transitions and adjustments. Um, it's leaving your ego at home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, you, your ego can't be the one making the driving decisions. Yeah, the number of rollovers that have happened just because of not stopping. Right. We could have right. we could have saved the car. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the forwards at all costs mentality. Yeah. It's yeah. like um, no, sometimes you know, eighty percent of the time, getting yourself unstuck is just backing up. <laughs> <laughs> Sooner than later, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so uh, it it's a lot more mental. You know, people want to hear they want to hear physical skills, and it's um, or or modifications of the vehicle. It's like go yeah. spend more money on your vehicle. That's go spend you know, more money on yourself. You can actually right. take yeah. it with you. Right. So yeah, leave your ego at home, look further, smooth corrections. You've talked a lot about, we, we call it mechanical sympathy when yes. we talk about the, the concept, but you, you talk a lot about being gentle on the car. Mm -hmm. And can you expand upon that a little bit? 
So the mechanical sympathy. So when I'm when I'm out in a Wrangler, I mean, I've spent so many hundreds of thousands of miles and hours, whatever, in in Wranglers. I mean, to me, it, it feels like an extension of my body, mm. and um, and that's that's a great place to be able to get. And, um, and some of that we can't necessarily train into you. We can do little exercises we do, you know, with new people. A lot of times we'll put cones out. So they're getting used to, mm. it's really hard to know where Feel the, the passenger side of the car is. I was going to say the right side of the car, but I know yeah. with, with you guys, I can't <laughs> specify right or left. Passenger yeah. side might be on the left side. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Getting getting used to the feel of the car and making it feel like it's an extension of your mm. body. Um, but if you if if you set your mind on that kind of goal, it's like all right, now I'm in this huge prospector, you know, and I'm going to consciously try to make a decision. Do I know where those each of those four tires are at any given time? Um, you know that that's that's going to help you a lot. Um, mechanical sympathy. I have people ask me questions a lot of times like, um, okay, so you're climbing Oldsmobile Hill at Glamis. It's like, so what RPM are you at? And I'm like, I have no idea. You yeah. know, I can, I hear and I feel the car. You feel that, that, that pressure back on the pedal and you know you're going to make it or not by how yeah. that pedal feels, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in the right gear, you know. Um, and so, and it's different for every car. It's different. If I put, take the 37s off the Gladiator and put 33s on, it's going to be different. You know? Yeah. So. Mm, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, those are, that is, um, that is excellent But it is, advice. like in the Rebel Rally, so uh, Emily Miller talks about, like, the car is your third teammate. Mm. So, you, you know, you take care of yourself, you got to take care of your navigator, and you got to take care of your car. All three of you have to, have to make it. Mm -hmm. And it's great when you have a passenger with mm -hmm. you um, that if that you can use them as a gauge, if they're uncomfortable, you know, the car is probably suffering too. Yeah. So, you can always yeah. tell. And if, if uh, for those that are listening, when you're driving, you're starting to exceed your skills when you're no longer able to maintain a casual conversation. Mm -hmm. I know when a driver is getting to their limits is because they will get quiet mm. and they, I will see the, the whites of their knuckles mm -hmm. around the steering wheel. And they'll they'll tighten their neck mm -hmm. and they'll stop talking. Mm -hmm. So when we when we're driving with someone, we can very quickly determine the skill of the driver in how casual they are in doing something hard. Mm -hmm. If they're very casual around it and they're able to talk to you and or maybe even right. explain what they're doing, how the car feels, then right. you know that you're dealing with someone that's well within their capability. If you see your passenger start to grab for grab handles, exactly. holding their breath, <laughs> tensioning up, you see their feet pressing against the <laughs> firewall. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and the, and the problem with it is that don't we want to have fun with the people that we're out with? Yeah. Everybody's going to have a different level of comfort. Someone's going to be like, "Take me on the e-ticket ride. I want I want the craziest four wheeling that we can do." But then maybe you've got your grandma with you or whatever, right. like have it be an enjoyable experience for your passenger and you can tell how they're doing based upon their body language. <laughs> My dogs have a, an expression that they get on their face when they're, uh, a little they're like, mom. Yeah. yeah. When, when my greyhound stands up, that means that he is no longer having fun off road. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So these are, to your point, we're not only being mechanically sympathetic of the vehicle, mm -hmm. we're being sympathetic of the people in the vehicle with us. Right. Um, and that's when you actually start to have more fun because it's not an ego thing. It's not about pushing yourself or the vehicle to 90% or 95% because it, you can so quickly, if something goes sideways, be at 105%. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have enough talent to save the day. Yeah. Right. And that happens to people all the time. People run out, right. I, I think with modern cars, you know, I'll say that one of the greatest risks is running out of talent. Like, um, let's take a, a TJ. Driving really fast in a TJ was like self-correcting. <laughs> you could only go so yeah. fast before your kidney ended up someplace else. Yeah. With the JK, people could take it a little further. Yep. With a JL or a Gladiator driving fast, they can take it mm -hmm. even further. I mean, these cars are... They're better and better. You know, we think like, oh, it's a JK. It just has the, the Pentastar. Yeah, it, it has just under 300 horsepower. Like mm -hmm. pickup trucks had that 10 years ago or, 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 or whatever the, you know, the, the example is. It's still a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, Raptor, TRX, these things. Yep. Like 700 you can, horsepower. You can get yourself yeah. in trouble really, really quick that's if right. you don't know what you're doing. So I think using the passenger, um, I think that that's really important. It's, it's also, and 
I, I know I'll put my old lady voice on. I know Matt can't re- <laughs> relate to this, but Scott will hear what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like we come from. Are we talk uh, about Morse code. Hey, hey, oh, <laughs> no, I'm pa- talking about pre power steering and ABS. Oh, yeah. I, know, I know you can think of them as antique cars. I, I, they were I, just I, cars to us. So <laughs> <laughs> it was just called a car. <laughs> vintage. So that, does that make you guys my vintage friends? Oh. Yes, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Uh, but those skills that you have to develop to, you know, handle, even even a TJ actually yeah. is pretty rudimentary in that mm-hmm. regard. Um, and we got the JKs that had the first electronic stability control, mm-hmm. um, and it 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 takes away that responsibility from the driver and puts it on the car to keep you from skidding out of control, yeah. you know, in a in a icy turn or something like that, which is great. I think it saved a lot of people, but. Um, it's, it's also wonderful if you have the skills to do that for yourself so that, um, A, you're still making good driving choices, um, and B, you know what the car is doing, and you can really appreciate yeah. what the car is doing mm-hmm. for you. Um, when I got in a, uh, the TRX for the first time, I was amazed at, you know, th- that thing goes as, or stops as well as it goes. It has good you know? brakes. Yeah, um, and it's amazingly forgiving. Um, but yeah, at the speed at which you need it to be forgiving, if it stops being forgiving, <laughs> yeah. then yeah. you are in trouble. But <laughs> yeah, it's um, so easy to exceed that. And, and I, yeah. and I think that leads me to the next question is as modern vehicles have gotten so good, let's take a, a wildcat or wild track Bronco lockers, front and rear sway bar disconnect or a Rubicon or whatever. These vehicles are incredibly capable from the factory. Right. You don't really need to modify them right. in most conditions. So since the vehicles have gotten so much better, the OEMs have adopted a lot of the, the aftermarket accessories right into a model of, of the car. Training now becomes the most important consideration. So what would you su- what would you suggest, Nina, around training like what should someone be looking for first like how do they find a trainer Mm. what is the curriculum that they should be looking at first that you have found to be most successful Um, do you suggest that people use rental vehicles or their own vehicles what are some of the things that people should be looking for in training that's a lot of questions yeah okay so we had our next hour planned out here (laughs) um so yes absolutely and thank you i was like oops Scott's my greatest uh, marketing tool here. He's like, <laughs> everyone should take training. Yeah, what well, he said. No. <laughs> um, they are very complicated. Um, the Rubicons, um, as you know, you know, now come out and, the, and they have different programming. You're in two high, you're in, you go to four high, your traction control system, your stability control system, which are two different programs, um, four low, then you have your axle, uh, axle lock front and rear, and you've got sway bar disconnect. And just, you know, we can spend an hour trying to get people just to understand those buttons. Sure. And you've been in our parking lot. We have those bumps. We call them the bumps that are in our back parking lot where we can get the vehicles articulated just to, just to show them that. Um, so that's like the very first thing we've had people rent Jeeps from us. They have Jeeps at home and, you know, just our standard, we're sending you out for the day in a rental, our standard, you know, 20 minute orientation. They're like, I learned more in this 20 minutes mm. than I have 10 years owning a Jeep, you know, mm. So there's still, I think more and more people are coming up as trainers. You know, Bronco has their off rodeo program yet uh, now, and that's that's great. The more training that is out there, um, the better it is yep. for all of us. Oh, the better it is for our trails. Yes, and that's why I'm a huge proponent of training, yes. so we can keep our trails open. Yep. Um, tread lightly. Yep. Organizations like Tread Lightly um, do a lot towards educating people about uh, you know this. A lot of people think off-road. That actually, here's something we can get on board with is uh, just some of the terminology that we use. As you know, in, auto, in the automotive business, we have, um, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank. I mean, that just between, thing. yeah, so so like uh, Toyota has the A-Track system yeah. And, yeah. and crawl control. And Jeep, we call it traction control and um uh, Jeep just has and the select speed stuff. control, yeah. you know, so we have all this different nomenclature um, in the trail use world. You know, we've caught we call this off roading and actually off road by, you know, insurance and land use definition is, you know, leaving the established trail. Correct. And so some of this terminology that's that's common is like something that, you know, we need to work on defining better for people because people, are, uh, you know, we see it in Sedona, you know, um, they think, OK, as soon as we leave pavement. We can drive wherever we want, yeah. and we don't have to wear a seatbelt. 
and we yeah. can drink whatever we want. Yeah, and sure. It's like, yeah, that's no. <laughs> not, even cl- not even close. Yeah, yeah, not even close. Um, and there are very few areas of the country where off-roading, where you don't have to stay on trail, um, yeah. is is actually legal. Yeah. Like Glamis, like Cinders, um, and and help me out here. I'm thinking uh, Cinders is actually the only place in the entire state of Arizona that you can drive off trail. Yeah. I can't think of anywhere else where yep. it's legal. Yeah. And there are some of those in California yeah. where they're just full OHV areas yeah. and you can just kind of drive wherever you feel like. Right. Which I'm glad like that those Glamis. places exist. Yeah. yeah, I think too, those places so. yeah. need to exist. Yeah, but, for sure. you know, again, to, to recognize that off-road does not right. mean off-trail. Right. Yep. I said that right. Yes. So, but it's the term off road. So, you in Sedona, you've seen them. We have the signs everywhere, the Forest Service signs that say off road driving prohibited. We've had guests, bless their hearts, turn around and say, we, Are we sure? You, I think we went the wrong way because we saw a sign yeah. that uh, off road driving prohibited. It's like, no, no, no. That's, thank you for being conscientious, but it just means you, you can't stay on a road. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, you have to <laughs> you, stay on the established on, trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, Boy, so, so let's see what. So yeah, let's circle back to yeah. what kind of training should people look for first? Okay, um, so absolutely responsible land use. If you do nothing else, and whether you're mountain biking, hiking, camping, you know, whatever. I mean, before you you go use public land, um, just have a basic understanding, and that in itself is challenging. What's yeah. forest service land? What's the difference between for national forest and, and national park? state trust land. We have so much public land, especially out here in the West, mm-hmm. um, you know, just kind of getting a basic understanding of the lay, lay of the land and, and mm-hmm. how to be out there responsibly. Then we move on to vehicles and, the, you know, it's really important to stay on trail and, you know, some basic um, outdoor. A, a lot of people just didn't grow up with a, with a mindset of this, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I, I like to think, put myself in 16 year old Matt's shoes that grew up, you know, in the land of, uh, you know, the suburbs and, and, and mall parking lots mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. You go to the West Coast and it's just like, it's so open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, I can drive here. I can drive here. Right. I can, like, drive wherever. And it's like, no, like, I think yeah. you have to have that etiquette. And I, we've definitely, I think, seen that during the pandemic where, you know, people who traditionally didn't go outside right? Um, or, or outside in the same way are starting to go camping and four-wheeling and, and whatever and, mm-hmm. and instilling that that respect, I think, for public lands. Right. Because it is way easier to close a gate than it is to open it. Yeah, I, w- I would agree. And that's certainly the factor going forward is why, that's why training is important because then a trainer can explain to you when do you go into four low right. from too high to reduce trail impact. Right. And save your tires. Tires are right. expensive. When do, you go Lockers, into, when do you go into four low? When do you engage a locker? Mm-hmm. Why would you do the sway bar disconnect? So do you recommend that people start off with like a two-day course or a one-day course? What are some of the things that as, people should be as looking As much for? as they can. If they can spend an hour, you know, in a, 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 you know, in a, in a group setting. In a, like maybe know, at an, an Overland Expo or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Overland Expo is great. There's a lot of training opportunities there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, even, you know, things like Jeep Jamborees. And sure. there's a lot of big clubs who, you know, incorporate um, training, um, at least just some basic stuff sure. to, in some of, the, some of their things. We're doing that with, with Red Rock Four Wheelers and Moab. Um, we're actually, um, we've been doing some things where we're training um, the trail guides, which is which is really fun, is to go train the trail gui- yeah. guides, not just, so they can explain to their sure. people better, but, you know, kind of ha- have some consistency there too. Well, and, so. and a lot of those trail guides are so skilled Mm -hmm. but they have not been taught how to teach right so that's another part of it is how do you communicate that what you feel and what you've learned through decades of driving in moab Mm -hmm. how do you communicate that to somebody who just started right and like what are those basic principles well that that's that's great reminder nina on the i believe the critical nature of training right well, we, we believe so much in the fact that people should be spending more money on their travel than they do on their vehicle. Mm-hmm. And then you should be spending more money on training than you do on accessories and modifications. And if we look at it from that perspective, we will become much better drivers. Yes. Because if we use a stock Wrangler to go where we want to go and we learn how to drive it. Right. Then you realize, actually, I don't need that lift kit. I don't need those tires. And then right. we can use that money for gas and right i'm trying to think of a place that a stock 
Wrangler cannot go. <laughs> yeah, it has to get it's really a, extreme. It, it gets really extreme, yeah. honestly. I mean, we were talking about, like, I didn't think I was going to like the Gladiators. Oh, it's going to be limited, and we're going to take it. And I'm taking it on, you know, um, Terminator and, and yeah. Moab Rim and trails like that, you know. It's so, surprising. Right. But it is on 37s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that 99% of people don't need I mean, we lift the, and tires. We did the Rubicon anymore, and anymore. Gladiators stock. Yeah. yeah. You it's know, ama- like there's it's some amazing. things that we bypass like crazy stuff, but there might have been some three dimensional modifications. Yes, <laughs> they, 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 do, they do that. They do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's it's a pay to play sport too. So yeah. yeah. Um, and what but, what has what has been the thing that you've learned most from being a trainer this long? Like, what have you? What uh, observations ooh. have you gained about? individuals and people in training the i think for me the most important thing is never stop being a student yeah um and so i'm always looking i'm always i'm actively looking for what's the next lesson that i'm mm-hmm. going to learn um there's always of course there's always new tools and and, and equipment yeah. coming out and stuff like that but you can learn you can see things from the newest greenest student in your class and they'll ask a question or point something out that you never thought of that way and it's like that's, That's actually cool. really cool, you know, so. Yeah, I think that the humility within the training ranks is super important because right. someone being teachable as a trainer mm-hmm. is as important as them being a good teacher. And I think we see that a lot. We talked about ego earlier that there's this impression that if I have become a four-wheel drive trainer, I have to know everything. Mm-hmm. It's physically impossible. I mean, right. If, if you if you had a large staff of trainers, like let's say 7P, for example, where you had a half a dozen individuals that are very well versed, you start to get closer to knowing a lot of it. But if you take one trainer that has done a lot of things, they can really only know so much. Like yeah. one person can only know, they've only been so many places. Maybe right. they haven't been to the polar regions or or maybe they haven't crossed the Sahara or what, right. maybe they, ha- they haven't done these things that help fill in the gap. So I think for the trainers that are listening, it's, it's keeping that sense of teachability and that, and that humility with your students, because otherwise people get, they get really turned off by the fact that like, they've got it all figured out. We, none of us do really. Right. Yeah, I know I don't. There's like trainers I won't recommend anymore because, you know, they went from being the guy that went to off-road parks mm-hmm. and, you know, they're the king of Roush Creek and now all of a sudden they're overland trainers. And I'm yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. So okay. we uh, the the association that I'm part of the uh, International Four Wheel Drive Trainers Association. Um, that's one of my favorite things. Is like um, you know a couple of times a year they're doing testing in varying par- various parts of the country in the world and yeah. um, the testing new trainers to see if they'll qualify to be certified um, a member of the association. But it is the so I usually go as an instructor um, as. To, to these, but I always learn a ton. You know, you get sure. people coming over from Australia and the Netherlands, and it's like they have tricks and equipment and totally. knowledge that you're never yeah. going to, yeah. you know, get on your own, and that you get to share in that and learn. I learn so much every time we do a testing. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fun to go to a different country and see how they solve problems. Like, you go to Iceland, they have these giant dump valves on their tires. Oh. Like, we worry about airing down. Like, it takes forever with the, yeah. you do the valve core removal thing. And you're, yep. But these, it's like, it's like a half-inch pipe coming out of it. <laughs> I mean, it just, like, it airs down instantly. Yeah. Like, and even though they're 44s, they air down yeah. in, like, 30 seconds. Nice. Um, so those are the crazy things that mm-hmm. you learn from other cultures of, of, of four wheeling, which is, which is, I think really important. And a special thanks to this week's sponsor, the medic. When you're heading out, you don't want anything to hold you back. Whether you're planning a week long adventure or a quick overnight trip to your favorite outdoor spot, we've got you. The medic CFX three powered cooler is designed with any size adventure in mind. The CFX3 allows you to bring more of your favorite food and drink along for the ride, no matter how far you plan to go. Available in multiple sizes, the CFX3 is built for the demands of outdoor use and comes with a handy app that gives you complete control at your fingertips. It's the -the state-of-the-art, designed-for-rugged-use cooler that you can rely on and enjoy for years to come. So um, another question that I've got for you, um, because I've seen you at these events and I've seen you work with a lot of variety in individuals, which means some people that are green or some people that are experienced or they're commercial clients. You are an excellent communicator on the trail. What are some of the things that you've learned about how to keep people calm, how to 
have effective communication within a group of people that maybe don't even know each other. Right. Um, it's, you know, it's, you, you need to set the tone immediately that, um, that it's okay. We're all going to do dumb stuff out here and we're, you know, I'm going to try to talk you through it. So you don't feel like you're the one looking dumb, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, and, uh, and just to make it fun. And also that, um, like that I'll, I'll make mistakes or I'll, you know, I'll have airhead moments or something like that. And, and that always, at first it seems to put people back on their heels a little bit. Like, do I want to go out with this person? Do I want to follow this blonde woman <laughs> out into this terrain or whatever? And, uh, um, but the, um, it, it's just, you know, the whole, oh, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I Like, that's one of the first things I'll say a lot of times is I'll say, uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Of course, we're mm-hmm. going to make fun of you later, mm-hmm. but, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll answer you seriously, you know, on, in front of everybody else, you know, and that gets everybody laughing. <laughs> totally. And, well, so what I've observed in the mm-hmm. events that I've attended that you were there is that you, you do a, a really thorough driver meeting in the mm-hmm. beginning. So you you help people know what to expect. Yes. So that starts to settle them down immediately. So they kind of know what this is going to be like. And then you reassure them that, okay, either this vehicle is well suited for this, or we've got spotters that are set up at the difficult spots. And you start to make the, the, the group feel much more comfortable. And right. then you do interject humor into it, which I think gives the levity that those kinds of situations need, where people need to just feel like it's not a big deal. Like right. we're out here having fun. Right. And that it, this isn't this isn't about being perfect, and nobody right. somebody's going to get stuck. Right. I mean, I think even at the TRX launch, somebody got stuck at the TRX launch up in the cinders, and and there and maybe even some sliding off trail, and and <laughs> and so some real challenges can come up, which are moments for people to learn if they're open to it. Right. Right. And and it can happen to any of us. Um, the, I have the, uh, you know, I have the. Um, what is the word I'm looking for? The good fortune, I guess I should say. It's like when I do get stuck, most people think you know, oh, 100% she did it on purpose. Most of the time I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the, like, I just posted a photo this morning from the dunes this weekend, and it was like we had talked about, oh, we're going to go take you out to some witch's eyes and teach you how to get out of them. And it's like, And I genuinely just blew it on this one, the side of this one dude, and it just ended up sucked right down, you know, the filling in the taco. And sure. <laughs> and everybody's like, oh, she did it on purpose. But yes, yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. Bring me a latte. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good, though. I love I love getting stuck because it yeah. just forces me to relearn yeah. and I stay need to current. I need a Glamis course with you. Oh, yeah, yeah wouldn't you, that be fun? You had an open invitation, you know. Yeah. Yes. I need that to TRX like... would have been, oh, man, that would have been fun. Except Chris Walker got to use it in all of the dunes. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your motorsports career. So you yeah. have been involved with the Rebel Rally since I think the beginning. Is yes. that correct? Yes. The very first event? Yep. Um, and we, Matt and I both, and our organizations are huge believers in that event. I think it's one of the most important events that we have each year because it has gotten so much OEM engagement. Yes. It has it has really reinforced these traditional navigation skills. Most people use stock or near stock vehicles. Um, so across the board, I think that this has been one of the most beneficial new events that I've ever seen in my career. So it's it's very exciting to see. Tell tell me about how you've seen that evolve and you've won it several times. So give us the give us the playback on like when you won, what were you driving, and what you learned? Yeah, what was the first first year that you won? The first the first year. So um, we've been on the podium almost every year um, and won bone stock three times. Yeah. Um, and that's always been my, my, my primary goal is always uh, the bone stock award um, to just to compete in the vehicle that it just in the exact way it came out of the factory. Um, and it's awesome that so many of the competitors out there, whether they're modified or not, but they're the same cars, they take them home and that's what they go get their groceries. It's totally. their daily driver. And there's really no other you know, major competition like, like that yep. in the United States or anywhere that I know of. But the, the, the Jeep that I won in this year um, was a, it was a four, four by, by E. e. Yeah, yep. so you won bone stock, you won the 
electrified designation yes. and you and won overall, overall right it was and four by four class if you want i like, think that was i think that's a sweep <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> i think that's kind of a sweep like, <laughs> and four stage wins out of seven days like I mean, I, I was, who's what they, yeah. but they do have they do have like an all-wheel drive <laughs> class as well yes like, okay yeah they call it the um x cross x cross x cross yeah. class cool. yeah. yeah it was crazy this year i was on rebel and how you, I mean, you dominated this year. It, it, it was Crushing. Crazy. It's like you're sitting on, you know, I had on my iPad the trackers and I'm yeah. watching staff and I'm watching this and it's like, damn, like Nina's like, like miles ahead of people. <laughs> 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 and it was, it was really impressive. And I think that's the cool thing with Rebel that's happening is we're on the seventh year of Rebel now. Oh my gosh. It, is it seven? This will be the seventh year. So 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah, seventh year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. How time flies. And you're now seeing this, this new genre in motorsports evolving, and you're mm -hmm. seeing competitors involve, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. evolve. And it's, it's getting really, like the competition mm -hmm. is, is harder yeah. every year. Yeah. And there's more people that can win each year. Right. Um, you know, I feel like when it first started, there's a lot of the, uh, the gazelle rally people that were kind of those, yes. you know, like, okay, like you've kind of got the heads up because you've done this before, but now right. there's this, this domestic contingent of women that are like badass to do this stuff. Right. It's really oh, cool. Big time. Yeah, well, big and time. It, it's, um, the, and you know, we were involved in training some people who were going to the gazelle before the rebel rally even started. Yeah. Um, and, and training for that, um, Tr training for the gazelle rally is a completely different i can't put rebels and gazelles in the same class when we're out at the dunes because it's completely different and in, in gazelle it's about driving in a straight line it's about the shortest mm -hmm. distance um and then in the rebel rally it's about being accurate and um and so you know we to call it driving in cursive because smooth driving in the dunes isn't going to be the straight line you're not going to be bombing up and down you know yeah. dune faces but in the rebel or excuse me in the gazelle that's, we are, we are trying to teach them how to do that. And it's really rough on your body and your car. Oh, you know? for sure. So, um, it is but definitely Emily, not the best way yeah. to get through the dunes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Emily Miller, having competed in the gazelle rally, she knew that and, and she knew she didn't want to do that. And she designed this rebel that we get, we get to be good drivers Yeah. to be, uh, efficient and, um, but it is, and she, you know, it, it's not a race for speed. It's, um, but, but speed is definitely, I mean, like you said, I mean, we set, we set a pace. Well, you had, it seemed like you had a plan this year. Like you, you were, you, you realized, or I mean, not realized maybe. Win. That was. <laughs> <laughs> Win, winning, winning love was the plan. I love it. I love but it. But it seemed this year, your key to success was efficiency. Yes. Like watching on the trackers mm -hmm. or watching you come through places, you had a plan. Mm -hmm. You'd go through, boom, mm -hmm. done, get the checkpoint, move on quickly. Right. Where a lot of a lot of competitors kind of hang out, take some pictures, right. whatever. It's like that's how right. you Make were lunch. so far right. ahead because <laughs> there are speed limits right. and it, it, there are public lands and right. it's not a race; it's a rally. Right. Um, yeah, it, it that's was, the place to make up time. Yeah. Right. For sure. Yeah, it wasn't. There was, there, as you know, there were there were plenty of competitors that were driving faster. Oh yeah, um, than us. I we had never two people sped. almost yeah. hit my earth roamer this year on like you know like there's a ninety degree turn and we're taking photos and that means that they need to do eighty mile an hour to that ninety degree turn and lock it up and I'm like I just watched this one car just like straight through yeah and I'm like sitting in doing you know TSD scoring yeah it was crazy like there were some people this year that. Um, <laughs> Well, and them they're going interesting. Well, yeah. they're going to the organization and the competitors will need to grow from that because sportsmanship is so important in events like that, particularly since the Rebel has always been known for that. Right. And they've always been known for this camaraderie and helping others right. out. And you don't help out anyone including yourself when you break the rules. Right. And it and if actually it what it does is it puts the the event at great risk, yep. especially if someone has a very serious accident with a local rancher that's just trying yeah. to bring his groceries home. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be a challenge, obviously, for the rebel going forward is making sure that people are not speeding. It doesn't mean that at times you don't slightly exceed the speed limit because you come off a rise, right. but you just, you're constantly checking your speed. Right. Um, and that shows that you're paying attention in right. my mind. Otherwise you're just pushing, pushing, pushing. And that, that's a real risk. 
and, and it is the pace. I mean, we're driving 10 hours a day. And yeah. so, so the pace is, um, there isn't one answer for everybody. Like you were saying, it's, um, you know, how, how long can you be relaxed? I mean, if you are white knuckle for 10 hours, you're exhausted. You're totally. going to make some you're bad smoked. decisions. Yeah, you're yeah smoked. exactly. And so it's just, it's just pushing right to that. Here's as fast as we can go. That's, you know, comfortable for the car and my navigator can still look at her stuff, you mm-hmm. know, and, um, and I can maintain this and not be just completely toast in, within a few hours time. So, so when you're, now that you've done this for six years, going on seven years, mm-hmm. what are the top two or three takeaways for you on how the rebel has changed you as either a person or a driver? Oh boy. So, um, so personally, it's definitely, um, that the control being a business owner, um, being the trip, oh, the trip leader, you know, all the, uh, the alpha, it's always, um, just showing up just to see what gets thrown at us for the day is yeah. Emily likes to have her, her twists and turns and stuff. And it's great. And, and, it, and, it, and at first, um, it's, it's like stressful because you're like, oh, I'm not prepared for this. I don't think, but, but no one else is either. Sure. You know, I remember that one of the big lessons for me on the very first rally was, I don't think it was like day three. So I don't even remember what day it was. Um, we had what we felt felt was just a really crappy day. It was just like, oh my gosh, we blew it. We missed so much today. Um, you know, and we kind of, we came back with our tail dragging between our legs and stuff. And then, you know, when the scores come out and everybody else is kind of down and stuff too, and scores come out and it's like, we were, you know, third place for the day. It was like, well, we sucked less <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> than most people, you know? So it's, and you allowed yourself to learn from that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you don't know, you know, until the dust settles, you know, what happens you're competing against, you're competing against yourself, but Mm-hmm. There is no, there's no perfect day. I, I remember telling Emily too, at one point it was like, if you really want to, you know, screw with my head, give me more checkpoints than I can do in a day, you know, that I can't, that I have to you like have, to have items on my <laughs> list that don't get checked <laughs> off that day. You know, my to-do <laughs> list is incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Well, congratulations so, on so much success with you. the Rebel and for always being a champion of that event. Thank you. And even beyond that, for those that are listening that would like to compete in the in the Rebel Rally, um, this is a women's only navigation and driving rally that's conducted in Nevada and California. It's it's a very long technically three and technically states Arizona this year. This year yeah, this technically past Arizona. Year, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it's a very it's a very long route and it's an incredible undertaking that. Nina also provides a lot, uh, as well as others, but there are there are individuals that can help train you to compete in the Rebel. So if you've always wanted to do it, if you've thought this is the coolest thing ever, which it is, then <laughs> how do you how awesome. do you get prepared for that? There are there, the organization, the Rebel Rally has people that can talk to you, give you advice, um, help you work through the process, and then there are trainers available like Nina that can take you in the dunes, show you how to drive your vehicle in the dunes so that you're well prepared to at least enjoy the event. So right. all of those resources are And you can rent a Jeep from Barlow Adventures. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah. I didn't know that. And we even include the Max tracks. <laughs> <laughs> how cool is that? Little plug for you, little plug for me. All right. So now we're going to do a little rapid fire with you. So uh, what is your favorite stuck story? You oh, getting stuck. I already told you one with the uh, don't let dad catch us with yeah. the truck on the ranch. You know? <laughs> oh, what my What was your goodness. craziest, I mean, your deepest stuck? Oh, my deepest stuck. Where you just were wow. like hours trying to get out. That was, that was one of them, definitely. My gosh, there's a, so most of the time I got to think about like, um, you know, most of our nastiest recoveries fortunately have not been myself. Sure. You know, it's, it's other people, you know, that we just encounter on the trail even. All so right. So you're, you know. you're in, the, you're in, you got the whole family in the TJ. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, and we were, uh, this, so this was like the early days of GPS, you know, right around the time Matt was born. Mm-hmm. And um, it was like, remember the old analog G- GPS that was just like all you had was totally a, the yellow a, one. Yes, and the the black the black line on the screen. There's and no topography. It. There's yeah. no yeah. Sure. You knew that just, and you could was you knew your GPS coordinates, way. right? Yeah. <laughs> right. You, you you get your GPS coordinates and you could see your track. Sure. Yeah. You know so which was perfect. And so we're you know uh, and so we had made a wrong turn in Grand Staircase Escalante and um, and we we're you know yapping yapping and didn't really realize it until we were like miles 
you know, east of where, where we thought we should be. And, um, and of course, we're in a TJ, so gas is, <laughs> gas is always a All significant concern. Right, exactly. And, um, and so then uh, we got turned around and we, we had to use, this was, uh, so uh, we had an Arizona Atlas. I think it was a Delorme Atlas. Mm. And we knew our GPS coordinates. And so it was one of those moments where, uh, you know, you got to, you know, trust, trust, trust the equipment because you think, oh, well, for sure we're here. And the GPS coordinates say, you know, you kind of get your fingers together on the map. Sure. Like, it says why we're over I, here. Why am I in Monticello? Yeah, right. <laughs> it, and the track, like I'm looking at the road on the map and the turns it made, and it looks like our track that we just did. That can't be right. You know, it's like, no, it's, the, it's that's, that's, that's right. true. <laughs> so you are over here and you don't want it to be because now you've gone, you know, 40 miles out of your way on a. 180 mile range tank of gas that <laughs> totally <laughs> happens right exactly so um uh and and we finally we finally kind of made it on fumes so that we're literally gas light is on and we're coming into we made it down back down to like smoky mountain road you know now mm. we're now like you know 10 miles out of escalante or something sure. where we're, we know there's gas station and uh, we see that this guy on this atv three wheel of course back then you know back and then, uh, <laughs> those days before my ATC. birth <laughs> um and he uh uh and he's like oh i'm looking for my dogs have you seen a couple of dogs out here we're like we're so glad to see you <laughs> another human you know? <laughs> someone like, that okay. can okay yeah. that's a great that's a great story <laughs> but that's um uh, you know, and it, it was, it, it, and I've had, I had a moment of that in the dunes, um, too, where it was, uh, I, you know, I've been out in the dunes a lot and there was a point where we got to, or, uh, okay. All right. You know, every, you know, we had a big old stuck, somebody got seriously buried and, you know, we're digging it out. It's starting to get dark. It's an overcast day. It's like, okay, everyone this way is the way out, you know, <laughs> and we start going and, and the Jeep, you know, the compass on the Jeep dashboard says north. And I'm, I'm like, no, no, we're going south. What's wrong with the Jeep? You know? <laughs> 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 so I get out and check the compass and it was like, oh no. Yeah. Trust the equipment there. Trust, yeah. trust your tools a little bit there. So. <laughs> well, which, which leads me to my next question. What is, I know you're very minimalist and you mm. tend to do very few modifications, but what, what are your fate? What's your favorite gear that you bring along on almost every trip? It can be anything. Okay. So, um, a shovel, mm -hmm. um, yeah, strap or a rope, you know, I I've gotten more and more to uh, prefer a kinetic energy recovery rope instead of a, a strap. Um, sure. even for towing, it's kind of, nice. I said, I think you and I have had a difference of opinion on, uh, when, you know, I'll, I use the kinetic rope a lot more than I used to. Sure. And I'll incorporate it in winching and everything. Get So just to give you a little mm -hmm. shock absorber, sort of, you know, so to speak. So so uh, the shovel, the rope, uh, max tracks is on most trips these days. And that's not just, you know, to, to throw in love across the table or anything here. <laughs> that, they, yeah, they true. work. They work. Yep. Um, and... Um, and your brain, honestly. Um, so one of the... Oh, I'm screwed. One, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> what one am I going to do? I got from, uh, <laughs> Wait, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> one, one of our trainers, John Marshall, uh, I steal this phrase from him, it's great. It's like, you don't always have what you want, but you always have what you need. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, of course, you know, basic stuff like first aid kit and and the preparation ahead of time of... Um, if I'm going into the deep back country... Um, you know, someone's always going to know where I am. And we have the advantage these days is, you know, a lot of our fleet vehicles, of course, have GPS trackers on them too. So it's yeah. like after the first rebel rally, my husband was like, you're never going anywhere without a tracker on your vehicle again. <laughs> I like that a lot. You know? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to worry about you as much. Sure. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're off being an adventurer. Yeah. So technology has um, has made things both easier, but it's also provided, as we've talked about before, is it provides a false sense of security out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, and on, um, and I think, uh, like the, we had the blizzard, remember the big blizzard in Tahoe, mm. um, right before the holidays. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and people were going, Oh, it's snowing. We got to go play in the snow and everybody's, you know, stuck out there for hours on I-80. And, um, and it's like, I think people have the mentality of, um, well, I can just, you know, I can always call 911 or something. And it's like, well, 911 couldn't get to them. You know, I know the guys that were the first responders up there and they were like, there was calls. They just couldn't make it they didn't have enough people yeah, or they sure. physically could not get to them you know? sure and um and so you know just 
just going out with the mentality in the first place that you're going to have to self-recover will make you or you have to self survive. So you're going to bring blankets along. You're going to bring water and food and those basic supply. Cause you never know when that, that three hour tour is going to turn, is going to turn into something. That's a reference that Matt didn't get. Hey, hey, I just sung the song, man. I know Gilligan's Island. You know Gilligan's Island. Uh, Okay. So I got a a generational test for you. What is this phrase? Where does this phrase come from? Pardon me. Would you have any gray poupon? It was the it was the commercial with Rolls Royce. I'm so impressed. Yeah, there, there you go. go. And it's not really. I mean, that's kind of like was Matt was actually generation. in that commercial. Oh, no. He was a little kid in the back. <laughs> yeah. Most most people your age think it's from you know it's a, a Wayne's World reference. Or something, you know? <laughs> uh, I actually grew up next to the town that Wayne's World was set in. Ooh. Grew up next to Aurora, Illinois. It there was, we go. Uh, Similar to what the movie led it to be. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of mullets. Interesting. Uh, okay. okay. That's good, <laughs> enough. good enough. Good enough. Aurora, Illinois. All right. So the next rapid fire question. Mm. If someone's going to do their top two or three modifications to a vehicle, what would you recommend that people do? The first thing is going to be tires. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, just out of necessity. So even though we talk about like, you know, Rubicons, for example, coming out of the factory, Jeeps coming with, you know, uh, more aggressive tires than we used to ever be able to get. They're still OEM tires. They're still usually a compound that's designed specifically to be go quieter and more fuel efficient. Mm-hmm. So the first thing I'm going to do is dump those. Get them. Let's get loud and Screw un- fuel inefficient, efficiency. right? <laughs> no, but, you know, usually, you know, the 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 um, the the tires that come from the tire manufacturers are usually going to be a tougher tire. Yeah. So um, the tires are literally, you know, what it's about. Where the 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 tires meet the ground, yeah. literally and figuratively. Um, so, you know, not not going cheap on your tires. Good, sure. good tires for what you're going to be doing. Okay, and then what would, the, what would be well, the next thing? So actually, first is training, right? We talked yeah, about yeah, it. Okay, then right. modification. Yeah. Um, and then tires. Um, uh, your equipment, just some of your basic equipment like we talked about. Sure. Um, oh, my goodness. What's next after that? Mm. What do you find What's that you like? That? A good quality jack. Yeah. The, 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 the factory and to make sure jacks. that it works with the vehicle because yes. after you, some people add a lift, larger tires, yeah. and the jack no longer works, yep. or they don't bring a base for the jack and then it doesn't work in the sand or in the mud, mm-hmm. for sure. And I think that this is what I love about asking this question is that it always comes back to these very simple things. Like yeah. no one has ever said a snorkel is my first. <laughs> and I'm not saying that a snorkel is a bad idea. I'm just saying that it shouldn't be the first thing that you do. Like mm-hmm. make sure you've got great tires, make sure that your spring rate is suitable to the load that you're carrying with you. I mean, these really make, basic make sure things. That your car isn't going to fall apart. Yeah. I don't know how many like Land Rovers I've seen and they have, they have all their perfect accessories. Mm-hmm. And then like they're, they're, no they're, maintenance. Their tie rod end is like moving like this. Yeah, totally. Or something. Well, because that doesn't look cool. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look cool. All right. So then talk a bit about, well, I mean, you're an entrepreneur in addition to being an adventurer and a motorsports winner. What are some books that you have really enjoyed in any of those categories? <laughs> or or maybe maybe you don't, maybe books aren't your no, thing. No, but. I am an av- avid reader. I'm just yeah. laughing because last time my husband was getting on my back, you, I, you need to go to sleep because you know, I was geeking out on this. Um, I'm reading a land navigation book right now that's like, yeah, very engrossing. What's the book? What's the name of the book? Oh my gosh. And you're going to ask me the hard questions. I'll have to send it to you. Okay. I don't we'll put, I, I we'll never remember the I name have of the two books different. I read. Right. It's a weird thing. I right. get so, oh, it's I a can book where this happens. Visualize this happens. the cover, but I couldn't sure. tell you. Well, we'll put it yeah. in the show notes. For yeah. Sure. No <laughs> Absolutely. problem. Absolutely. What are some other books that you've you've kind of come to love? Oh my gosh. Your favorite uh, fiction, non fiction? Lois whatever. Price. Yeah, she, her Lo- stuff's yeah. great. Lo- love her stuff. Um, yeah, I, I go back and forth between fiction and non fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do love to read other people's stories uh, of their of their world travels because there's a common thread of like, you know, crap's going to happen and you just figure out how to deal with it. Sure. And, that's, and if you're if you're waiting to go to, you know, when you think crap's not going to happen, you're just you're never going to go. Yeah, so. for sure. Well, that's that's great advice as well. So now, how do people find out more about you and what you do? How do people follow you on Instagram? Ah. How do they follow you on all of the my face twits and all those other things? My face twits, <laughs> twit face, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, do you TikTok? I do. I'd like to introduce <laughs> you to my favorite TikToker, oh. Scott Brady. Oh, oh. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> He's on it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> I don't TikTok. Yeah. Caleb does though. 
Caleb TikTok. Yeah. yeah. You, you hired a TikToker. Uh-huh. I, Did you know he was a TikToker when you hired him? He's really him? good at it. No. He's, ta- he's, <laughs> he's really me a good lot at of it. things. Like, right. um, you know, I, I now know the phrase, it slaps. That's something <laughs> that apparently. Um, See, now you're starting to feel like no, you've got it, another yeah, generation yeah, under you. Yeah, uh-oh. There you go. Weird, you know, life goes on. That's how, kind that's of how it works. I have all these like trendy words that I say because Caleb says them. Uh, there you go. I don't know. It slaps. I don't know what that means. I probably shouldn't say that out loud. That's the way I feel about it. I feel very. It, you feel dirty. It makes, yeah, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. I know. Exactly. All right. Well, we should probably figure out what that means before we say it again. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so. So how do they how do they find out oh. how do they follow you right. on Instagram? How do they follow okay. you on and. I'm sure you have accounts for yourself personally and then for the right. business. Right. How do, how do um, we do that? So like my, my uh, training stuff, um, uh, Instagram, we're very active on Instagram and to a lesser extent Facebook, but Instagram um, is Barlow Adventures. Barlow it is. underscore Adventures. We're going to put yeah. it right here yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> Deadpan <laughs> staring at the camera. All right. Um, and then how bar- do they follow bar- you individually? Uh, follow me individually. Like you, so like actually, your own, your my, own. Um, on Instagram, I do. Um, I don't. I don't have a personal account. Okay, I do. Sure. I do incorporate some more personal stuff on that Instagram account than I do on like the, the Facebook page. Sure. Facebook, we have a Jeep Rental page, a Sedona Jeep Rental page, and then we have you know Barlow Adventures, um, and then I have my you know my personal page on on Facebook. And then do uh, you have a an Instagram for your team for your racing team? Yes. Yes, and it's I. Oh my gosh, I just changed it. I think it's Team One Twenty Nine. Okay. If you do, if you Rebel I, Rally I Team One Twenty One Two Nine. Okay. Um, you know, at least you can find it by that hashtag. So. And then um, people can also find more about the Rebel Rally, RebelRally yes. dot com, mm-hmm. and they can find the Rebel Rally on Instagram as well to get more information on that. Right. And I guess I've got two more questions. Where do you want to go anywhere in the world? Like, what's your like? Oh, the, Chile. You want to go to Chile? I, I, awesome. I don't. Well, that's all. Uh, yeah, for whatever. That's that's like my hot button right Perfect. now. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Pisco sours and big dunes. They got them <laughs> yeah. They got them there. Right. It's like the sure. California of South America with a lot no less question. people. No <laughs> question. No question. Yeah, it's a wonderful country. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, you would love that. Okay. And then last question is, which we try to ask: if you were to give just one piece of advice to someone who is getting ready to be a Rebel Rally contributor or a, a competitor or a Traveler, what would be the the words of encouragement that you would give someone new to this? You you just need to do it, and you you, you start taking the steps. Um, it's overwhelming, and if when you get to the end of it and you look back and everything that you had to go through, you probably will, would be intimidated to start. Um, you know, but you you start, and you're it's never going to be perfect, like we talked about yep. a few minutes ago. Um, but you have enough. Mm-hmm. Just you know, get to the point where you have enough and take the next step. Yeah, and just go. You there know? you go. That's wonderful. That's wonderful <laughs> advice, Matt. Do you have any more questions for Nina? What's your favorite Jeep? No, oh. no. What? I'm going to retract that question. <laughs> what do you think the best Jeep ever made is? Ooh, ever made. Mm. It's honestly. You it's could like, have one you know, Jeep. I get, you know what I get? You I, could never sell. Oh my gosh. That's like asking you to like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hip one car and never yeah. sell. This, person. this is actually a person, the only person we've ever had on the podcast cars. that has more cars yeah. than you, Matt. Yeah. So. I want to buy Matt's coffee table book of all the cars I've owned. I'm, I'm going to do it. One, yeah, one that, day I will yeah. have a coffee table book yeah. one foot thick. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's already there almost, Matt. <laughs> so so honestly, the, the one that I have the most anticipation for right mm. now is the Gladiator 4xE. Okay. I'd love my Gladiator, but at, with all the other drivetrains available right now, it's the 3.6 or the diesel. The yeah. diesel's great, and if I trade this one in, it would probably be on a diesel. But um, the, the Gladiator 4xE, we know, is a couple years away, but that I'm really looking forward to. And especially with leaps and bounds, how the electrified is coming, Yeah, um, where we're going to be two years from now even. You know, we have some no concepts doubt. coming for East Cheap Safari. You know, it's, it's it's all coming. Yeah, yeah. it's all coming. I mean, the number of manufacturers that have set lines in the sand of being only yeah. electric by 2025, which is three years away. Yeah, unbelievable. That's but, why I'm keeping my LJ. There you go. That's the the uh, the infrastructure coming along with that. Yeah. I, did you attend the the Power Innovations um, or the the Rebel Rally Electrified session? 
they had power innovations on there. And, and as much as they were involved in the rebel rally with that, before that presentation, I had no idea how involved they are <laughs> with getting this infrastructure out there, including, you know, portable charging well, electric trailers just, and everything. So, you know, yeah. it seems that electric has become this almost contentious issue. Everything's contentious. You cannot, <laughs> like, why, why does, why does everything have to be I know, an argument? I know. It's like, there's it's nothing exhausting. wrong with an electric car. Keep driving your car if you want to. Like <laughs> the fact that somebody wants to buy an electric car, why do you care? I, I have like, an it, oil it, well on my roof. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like You're producing why, energy. That's yeah. why I want an electric car. I live in Arizona. Like if I lived, Lots in, of sun. Like, if I lived in Scotland, I'd think that that was a pretty dumb idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. But I live in Arizona, and I, I don't know. Right. Any other questions for Nina? I mean, that's really the one Jeep that you'd have if you could have one Jeep for the you rest of time. You can't believe it. What do you want a the answer to be, e Matt? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, it's like, I get this question all the time. What's your favorite trail? It's like, it really, it's the one I'm on right now. <laughs> yeah. I am like so geeking out on what yeah. I'm doing right now. You know, it's, You're uh, being in the yeah. moment, which yeah. is awesome. Well, yeah. Nina, thank you <laughs> so much for being on the podcast. We have thank been you. trying to get My you pleasure. out here for the longest time, a couple reschedules, but... We had you here today. You have been such an inspiration to so many people. You really have. And you've always been humble about it. And you have shared your knowledge freely with others. And you've been so supportive of new people coming into the Rebel and into backcountry travel as well. So everybody that's listening, please check out Nina and her adventures. And we will talk to you next time. <laughs> <laughs>